Mr. Groden, when you walk down the street and you're recognized, what, what movies do most people usually recognize you for? Uh, the Heartbreak Kid, I would say, is the picture that most people uh, come up and talk to me about. Okay. Yeah. And after that, we say Heaven Can Wait is a big film? Uh, the he Heaven Can Wait, uh, sometimes The Lonely Guy. Uh, seems like old times like that. Children, The Great Muppet Caper. Old timers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw a film on HBO, Movers and Shakers, which you, I guess, co-produced and, and wrote. And it seemed the film take a few swipes at, at Hollywood about writers and, and all the deals that have to go on with production. Did that film kind of reflect some, some bitterness you have about Hollywood? No. You know, I was asked that question before. I, really, I, I just really try to write funny. I'm just trying to write something funny. I really don't have... Uh, I mean, you know, Hollywood is what Hollywood is. Uh, Hollywood is an industry the same way uh, General Motors is an industry. And if you've been doing it for as long as I have, you know that. So, no, I just really try to write comedy. But uh, I'm a little, uh, I have to say, I guess I'm a little removed from, from a lot of this. I'll do things that people think, my God, look what he just said to David Letterman or what he said to Johnny Carson or look, he wrote that movie. I don't really feel that way about it. I'm, I'm basically an entertainer, and I'm not, uh, I'm not that emotionally invested in making that kind of a point. Okay. Well, speaking of Johnny Carson, in the press kit it said that you were under exclusive contract as a guest. How did that come about? I had done uh, The Tonight Show and the, when The Heartbreak Kid opened. Uh, I was on, well, this is when it was an hour and a half, and I was on uh, at seven minutes to one. It was over at one. That's the slot they usually have for the author and the slot where they usually say, we're not going to get to our last guest tonight. Uh, and then about three weeks later, or, the, or just the, the next day, actually, they asked if I'd come back in about three weeks. And then I was on a 10 to 1. And then the next day, they called and said, uh, he'd like to put you under contract exclusively for a talk show guest. I said, I, what is it? I never heard of it. He said uh, he had done it before with uh, David Steinberg and Joan Rivers. That was the only other time they had done it. and. Uh, what it meant was that I would be on earlier in the show and uh, every few weeks and that I wasn't to be on any other show and uh, you wouldn't be paid any differently but uh, so I did that for a while I don't live in Hollywood so I couldn't do it for too long and uh, I live in New York so it was just it was it was flattering I was very surprised well, one of the favorite scenes of I think everyone who saw the movie last night was when you play the FBI agent when you do the counterfeit bills and everyone was commenting how you can just steal a scene with just a look or a raised eyebrow. And, uh, are there a lot of times in the script where you're improvising, where there's dialogue, and you say, you know, I think I can have this come across without any dialogue? Yeah, well, we do, th we do shoot the scenes as they're written, but then we do improvise. And uh, so much of, the, much of what you might see ending up in the final film are things that are happening only at that moment. And, uh, you, you try to have as little dialogue as possible. Uh, I still have a lot of dialogue, but uh, you try to do it as little as possible because it's a, it's a visual medium and you try to do that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, are, are there any, any disappointments in your career? I read in the uh, same time next year, Ellen Burstyn went from Broadway to the movie version. Were you ever upset that, that you didn't follow and take the Alan Alda well, part? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I you know, I would certainly have liked to have been asked uh, to do the movie. I, it's so it's so common that when you star in a Broadway show and even win a Best Actor award, as I did in that play, that you're not asked to do the movie. It happens. It happens all the time. So I wasn't particularly shocked by it. Uh, I think in terms of disappointments, uh, the major disappointment for me would have been that after I did the Heartbreak Kid, I was a uh, I was very much in demand as a movie actor. And then the next picture I did was Eleven Harrow House. That didn't make money. And it, then it wasn't, it wasn't that I was in less demand. I was in no demand. I could have absolutely never have done anything. And that was shocking. I didn't realize it was that difficult. I mean, I had starred in two pictures. One was a hit and one wasn't. You would think, well, that happens with everybody. But I, at that point, it took me about three years before I really was getting offers to be back in the movies. Was the whole Ishtar thing, was that kind of a shock? Because do you think people kind of jumped on a bandwagon to crucify that movie? Oh, yeah. I think when, once they got the price tag into the title, the $40 million Ishtar, sometimes they try to make it the $50 million Ishtar, 
you're doomed. I don't think anything can survive that. You can't say the two and a half million dollar anchor man Dan Rather is on tonight. You know, everyone's looking at two and a half million dollars for that guy. Oh, I could do that for a lot less money. You just can't, you can't put a price tag on those things. And I think uh, there's an opportunity there to go after Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, possibly even Elaine May. And it wasn't the, uh, you know, it wasn't the best picture of the year. It certainly wasn't the bomb of the year either. Uh, I think it's one of the better pictures I've done. And, uh, you know, but comedy's very subjective. Uh, so, you know, somebody can be laughing out loud and the other person can be looking at them and say, what are you, what's so funny? I mean, that's just the way it is. And why people are constantly amazed at something they find funny someone else does and vice versa. I don't know why. I mean, the sense of humor is a very subjective thing. But I think the picture was, was very, of all the pictures I've ever done, I've never seen anything, I think, so badly mistreated as that picture. I mean, one of the reasons it cost so much money is that they worked so long and hard on it. It didn't cost money because they were asking for bigger dressing rooms. It's because they were working into the night and week after month after, and they just put a lot of time in on it. Let me just ask you really quickly, because we're almost out of time. Um, working with Robert De Niro on this film, because you seem like two totally different people on screen, at least your characters are. Were there any, uh, any funny stories about you two working together, about getting along at all? We got along uh, extremely well. We, we did from the very beginning. And uh, our, our relationship on the screen almost paralleled our relationship off the screen in that he's a shy person, and I'm a person that people don't quite know how to take a lot of the time. And once he knew kind of where I was coming from, he started to open up. And we, we really uh, developed a really nice friendship uh, as a result of this picture.